Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I have the honor of uh, spending a couple of minutes with Chuck Robbins, Cisco's chairman and CEO. So welcome, Chuck, to Inger Micro's One Experience, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join the thousands of partners around the world. You know, I can argue that Chuck is one of the biggest supporters of the channel. He's one of the most informed CEOs and supporter of not just distribution, but the entire channel's organization. And he knows about how this ecosystem can deliver value. And as a matter of fact, Chuck and I go way back. He was the Inger Micro executive sponsor way, way back when, uh, when he was running the commercial sales organization. So great to connect again, Chuck, for a few minutes. And thanks again for taking the time. Well, Paul, thank you very much. And it's really, a, it's great to be here. It's an honor and it's good to see you. And it's, it's always great to spend time with, with all of your partners and all of our partners. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks again. Uh, Chuck, as I kicked off this morning, earlier today in my keynote, I noted that Cisco recently created a new purpose statement and it's about powering an inclusive future for everyone. Can you share more about your envision and how you see this coming to life for our customers, our partners, employees, and communities around the world? You know, Paul, the irony is, is that we started working on our new purpose probably about a year or so ago, uh, pre-crisis and pre-COVID. And we, we took a step back and looked at, you know, we, we'd had a, a purpose statement for years of how the world, or changed the way the world lives, works, learns, and plays. And uh, we felt like, you know, through the build out of the internet, clearly we had helped do that. And so we, we started looking at what is it we stand for as a company? And so powering an inclusive future for all really resonated with me because it represents both what we do technologically and then what we do um, also from a corporate social responsibility perspective. And let me just uh, take you through that. So the first piece, what we do technically is we connect people all around the world. And when you think about the opportunity to actually take some of the new technologies and deliver connectivity into places that have never experienced connectivity before, into rural villages in emerging countries, or even into rural areas inside the United States or other developed countries, you actually begin to create an inclusive opportunity. You deliver education to those people, it helps them become more included. You can deliver healthcare. And so the technology aspects alone actually do create opportunity for people as they become connected and they get broadband, et cetera. And then also our, our culture and what we stand for aligns as well, because our corporate social responsibility actions and things that we do in our communities also support creating an inclusive future, whether it's taking network academies into community colleges and schools or even into prisons. You know, uh, we focus on really trying to help all those who are less fortunate, most vulnerable. And uh, so we think it lines up nicely with both our technology view as well as what we like to do in our community. So we thought it was good and it turns out it's been, uh, it's been quite appropriate this year. Excellent, I know you're setting the foundation for the future too. It's just not about delivering near term, but this is about setting up on a global basis for the future too. So great work you're doing there. As I said, I highly admire that. You know, one of the things I also admire is you talk about what you've done in investments around customer experience. And so you've done a number of things from hiring customer experience experts, improving processes. We've worked with you on some of those things that take some of the stickiness and, and ease of doing business, creating more automation. And again, that work really resonated with me. I was actually having a beer with Andrew Sage, the head of uh, global distribution for you, as you know, at one of our global uh, council meetings. And he started talking to me about this whole customer experience process. And I've actually made that in 2020 and beyond uh, part of our customer experience. So one of our initiatives is customer experience and technology is one of the three strategic pillars we have right now. And I know we got a ton of work to do around that. So are you where you want to be from a company expect uh, expectations with customer experience? Uh, that would be no, uh, but we've made a lot of progress and the teams are doing a great job. And you know, when Maria Martinez came in, one of the key things that she she pounded in my head and then we subsequently have, have certainly communicated through the organization is that customer success is not an organization, right? It's a, it's a company-wide commitment. And so there may be an organization that does part of it and creates the overarching strategy for the company, but it has to be you know, everyone's responsibility because if you think of how we build our products, the quality of which we build into them, the the usability we build into them, how we respond, uh, you know, from attack when we have from our attack when we have problems, um, how our 
customers frankly experience what we bring with you and our partners to them is part of the customer uh, success and customer experience organization. So it's, um, it's a, a big work in progress. We've made a ton of uh, headway. And I think that, um, you know, obviously we think about it across the breadth of the portfolio, but classically sort of customer success and customer experience has been, you know, tightly aligned to software strategies so that you make sure the customers are getting the value out of it. You're making sure the customers are adopting and using the solutions. And it's really for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, you, you certainly want the, the customer to derive value from what you're selling them. And then you want them to be incented to renew it when the subscription comes up. And it's a, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a complex uh, thing to think about, but uh, trying to drive that across a hardware model, a hybrid model with cloud management of hardware devices, a pure SaaS model, as well as an on-premise subscription model is a, it's a, it's a, it's a big task, but the teams are doing really well. And I think we have an opportunity to help play that role, meaning the channel partners and ourselves as we look at kind of focus, as you meant that outcome, the business outcome that they're focused on. One of the things I tell partners all the time is, are we selling the technology as a business outcome, but are we following that life cycle? So are we ensuring that they're using and adopting to what you said that business outcome would be. So what would your advice be for the collective partners on how we can improve end user experience around technology? I think that's exactly right. And uh, you know, we have to continue to evolve our programs to make sure they're aligned with that need to drive that adoption with the customer and to drive the, the, the success that the customer needs to feel and the, with, with the technology solution. So I think that uh, partners who, who think about investing in practices around this, around actually building capabilities that align to the offers that you're taking to your customers or those that are going to win in the long term. And certainly we will continue to evolve our programs, as I was saying, to actually reward partners who are doing that because it's so important to our future. And it's just core to the whole notion of trying to drive more predictability into all of our business models as we look to the future. So I think it's super important for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. That predictability and sustainability is important as we, we go down this journey together. So I said at the beginning, you know, we go back a long ways and you're, you're definitely a partner focused company and you've invested over many years and how the channel can be successful. But I would also say as much of a friend as you are of this ecosystem, at the end of the day, you're chairman and CEO of a very large publicly traded company and you got to deliver on behalf of the shareholders too. So knowing that there's benefits that are being driven, obviously, because I've said, look, even though Chuck understands this ecosystem better than most and probably the best out of CEOs of global companies, he still has to deliver. So knowing that there's benefits that are being delivered in the ecosystem, they continue to add value, meaning the channel continues to add value, our collective customers add value. And this year's no different. So despite the business challenges we've all faced in the markets this year and next year kind of seems uncertain, What's Cisco's commitment to the partner ecosystem, to the thousands of partners that are joining us today for, I'd say, for Cisco's fiscal year, which ends in July, but call it calendar year next year too. And how do you see these efforts translating into better business outcomes for those end users? That's a great question. I, I actually, we're fortunate in that I think that my commitment and what I'm trying to deliver for our shareholders lines up with our commitment to the partner community, because I, I do think there's so much value that uh, our partners bring to our model on a global basis that, uh, you know, it's it's super valuable. Uh, I do think, however, that we have to continue to evolve how we think about it and where the value is coming from, from both of us. And we've been doing this for over 20 years. And, um, you know, early on, we would go through these technology transitions and we would ask our partners to, hey, build a telephony business, IP telephony business, or, you know, build a build a security business or build a video business. And, um, and so those were more technology oriented trends. And now we're clearly, we've been going through these significant business model shifts. And I think that's just, that represents a different set of challenges for both of us, like Cisco, as well as you and our partners in understanding how to deliver value um, to, to our customers together. And uh, I think we've, we've done a good job of navigating that so far. And we just have to keep working together and, as I've joked on stage for years, we'll screw something up and when we do, we'll, we'll fix it. Uh, and uh, we learn a lot by just working together with you and understanding what's working and what's not. But I think that's probably the thing we have to really navigate is that it's, it's no longer just about 
evolving your business for technology trends, the biggest disruptions that we all face are, are underlying business model shifts. And uh, that's going to require us to be much more creative, nimble, and frankly, probably more bold than we would have to be in the past. Yeah, I think it goes back to you know what you said too about that business outcome and kind of what we're trying to solve for. And you made a bold statement, I think it was last year when we were all in Vegas together in front of thousands of partners at your event. And you said, it doesn't matter about Cisco being the logo on the front of the technology, it matters how Cisco fits in to deliver for that business outcome. You just said it's not about the technology, it's about what we're doing to deliver on that, uh, on that outcome. So what do you think, you know, the collective partner that are here today, what do they need to do to be future ready or ready for future? Yeah, I think you, um, you have to really assess what's going on right now, particularly in the impact of what we've seen this year on the strategies of our collective customers. And just, just like Cisco and, and I'm sure every partner out there, everyone stepped back once we got everybody working from home. Everyone caught their breath and said, okay, what does this mean now to my business? What does it mean short-term, mid-term, long-term? And we're executing on what we believe it means mid-term and long-term at this point. And many of our customers are, all of our customers are. And so I think it's, um, it's really important for us to understand that and understand what has changed since you know, COVID has occurred. So as an example, the, the technology that we all are using every day, so WebEx, the collaboration portfolio, we know for a fact that in the future, we're going to have a hybrid work world and we're going to have people in conference rooms and we're going to have people that are going to be joining those meetings remotely in every meeting, not most, every meeting is probably going to have a combination of in-room and remote. And so we have to figure out how we create an experience for every attendee in that meeting that is as productive as uh, you know being in the room. And we've uh, we joked yesterday that you know COVID has been sort of the great equalizer on the meeting front because everyone's remote. But at some point we'll go back. So that's something our customers are going to have to deal with. So there, I, I can tell you our customers will likely go into their offices and they'll put high definition video units in every conference room just so that they can accommodate remote use. And that's, that's something that is a new thing that's occurred as of COVID. The other things that uh, I think there's probably gonna be uh, an acceleration to the cloud. There will probably be an acceleration of cloud development methodologies. Uh, and there will likely be um, a, an acceleration of the integration of SD-WAN and cloud security. And I think there'll be an acceleration of customers wanting to consume any technology that we collectively sell as a service. So some of that we'll build as a service and we'll work with you. Some of that you'll put your services around and deliver. So I think there's just a lot of things that are changing very quickly and just staying on top of it. And you know, having that set of customers that, uh, that you trust that can tell you what they're thinking so that you can evolve your strategy, I think is really, really important right now because things are moving very quickly. Yeah, and I think it's important. I tell the partners often that that kind of specialization or know what you're really good at and take your IP and connect it into that solution as we continue to work forward or move forward. You know, partners love, I get questions all the time running a large company with regard to what we're seeing and getting advice. And so having you and having the opportunity to share with everybody else, I'm going to ask you the question I quite often get asked, which is what great leaders run in great companies? What's one piece of advice you can share with the business leaders today? of how they can lead their teams, and you just talked about it, the COVID and really in the face of uncertain markets and volatile markets. So any piece of advice you'd give the, the leaders out there today? Yeah, I would say that, look, at times like these, the simple foundational things are, are perhaps most important. And, um, and in the case of what we've experienced, I think communication has been so important. And I think that you know, when, when I think about the frequent communication that we have had with our employees and, you know, when, when COVID first hit, uh, we started doing weekly check-ins and we'd have 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people joining them. Um, in fact, the first one we launched, we gave 30 minutes notice. We had 15,000 people on a Friday afternoon join the, the, the session. And we did them every week for a while. And then recently we went to every other week. Um, and we've had, you know, in that case, we've had doctors, we've had mental health experts. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we, we've had, uh, you know, business strategy updates, just keeping people close. And I think that the thing I would say is communicate frequently, authentically, and honestly. And I mean, it is so important right now because 
it's, it's very difficult to create trust in the middle of a crisis. So it's, it's always better to have it going in, but those are the things I think right now from a communication perspective that are so important. And the other thing I would say is just understand where your employees are right now because everyone has some unique aspect of what's happening to them right now that you need to understand. Uh, because you know they're going, they have a set of pressures that you, you you probably don't see necessarily, and so that's why we have this big focus on mental health because everyone is is dealing with fatigue right now. Everyone's dealing with the stress of either being isolated or having small children or having their parents at home with them or or whatever their stress point is. There is one, and so I've been telling our employees find your therapy, right? Whatever that is, you need to build it into your schedule. Uh, you know if it's a yeah, I, I, I talked two days ago, I, I called my head, my chief people officer, and uh, it was like two in the afternoon, and she had just come in for a, from a run, and so she's like scheduling runs at like one o'clock in the afternoon, so she works several hours, and she gets a break, and she clears her head, and then comes back, because as, as much as this technology has helped us keep moving forward as a global economy, it's also just really draining, and um, so anyway, I think communication and just fo staying close to your employees and where they are mentally is really important. Yeah, that's great feedback. And you know, relationships still matter no matter what, whether they're internal relationships. Look, I miss sitting down and being able to see and shake a hand and look eye to eye. And like you said, it leveled the playing field, but being able to have that authenticity and having that conversation both with employees and then with your end partners too, because it trickles all the way down to them having to deal with the same thing and trying to run small businesses in many instances also. So let's, let's switch uh, gears just a little bit. And you, you touched on a couple of different aspects of the technology and where you guys are focused. So it's your cloud and software solutions, um, big growth opportunity for channel partners, you mentioned generating greater reoccurring revenue as well as having more flexibility uh, to serve the end businesses in a variety of ways. Like you said, taking their own pieces, being able to add the solutions that you have and you have such a wide breadth of, of offerings today to be able to deploy. And the pandemic shift, you mentioned that a little bit too on remote work having highlighted for you know, the need for customers and how they consume technology in much more flexible ways to ultimately fit everybody's needs. So can you talk a little bit about Cisco's transition and focusing on cloud first software services and what this means for all the channel partners? You know, the success that we've seen over the last few years of transitioning to software has been um, it's been relatively strong. We exited fiscal year 20 just a couple of months ago with $10.5 billion in SaaS and subscription software. And I think five years earlier when I started this job, it was somewhere around three. And so it's been a big move because that's a heavy lift for, a, for what you know, has traditionally been known as a hardware company. And we're just in the middle of this transition. So we have a, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of opportunity ahead of us. And I think that um, you know, we're also, I think this, this pandemic has just accelerated the need for us to deliver everything that we deliver as a service or cloud managed. Uh, and so you're going to see that uh, transition continue to accelerate. Uh, and for the partners, I think it's just a, it's just a natural evolution. Uh, I think you can look at the fact that we're building APIs into virtually all of our technology stacks now. So creating, you know, application businesses where you can build either productivity or operational tools on top of networking platforms or productivity apps on top of collaboration. Those are kinds of things you could be contemplating in this environment, uh, creating your own set of real managed services capabilities uh, or leveraging what, you know, our partner Ingram can deliver with you. I think those are opportunities as well. Uh, but um, I think the biggest thing right now is just really spend time with your customers and understand where they're headed because I think there's some there's some fundamental shifts going on. And, uh, you know, software is, is just this interesting transition for us because it is highly efficient for us as as we deliver technology software as a subscription, as an example. It's just very efficient. Uh, it's also efficient for the customers to consume it and it gets them to the outcome faster. And it's good for our shareholders because it leads us to more predictability. And I think there's an opportunity for you to build great businesses around it. So it's, it's, it's really one of those things that's good for all of us. And we just have to make sure we stay close on, you know, what that looks amongst that ecosystem. Great, yeah, we're very symbiotic relationship across the entire channel. And again, you guys are open to the feedback. Like you said, if 
certain things aren't, aren't working well and people speak up, you're definitely willing to listen on, on how to get it right. So as we wrap up, you know, what are the most, maybe you've mentioned them, but are there any last things from a maybe most critical initiatives that you're leading to ensure greater success for, for Cisco? Because we know success with Cisco means that's success for the partner ecosystem also. Look, you're, you're going to see us uh, focus on cloud delivery and as a service in our core enterprise portfolio at a much faster rate. You're going to see us continue to deliver on the transformational opportunities within the, the carrier and the service provider to web scale space uh, with new platforms, with, you know, uh, lots of, of orchestration and our silicon and our software stack. You'll see that uh, you're going to see us really invest in the future of work around this platform as, as well as the security capabilities that we need to deliver. You're going to see us continue to expand into the application uh, area with a new modern you know, cloud development stack. Uh, and that comes from both observability as well as security and other areas. Uh, and you'll, uh, you're going to see us uh, begin to evolve and bring out edge solutions, both at the carrier edge, the internet edge, the enterprise edge, and the cloud edge. Um, pick your edge. And, uh, and so I think those are areas that you should stay close to and just keep an eye on. We're going to be investing in all of those. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think, I think we're going to come out of this stronger. Uh, and I think that uh, hopefully as a society, we come out uh, and uh, we're, we're better off. And I'd like to think that somehow we, we find some compassion back at uh, once we come out of this as well. So we're looking forward to it. And uh, Paul, I can tell you this, there's nothing I would rather do than actually be shaking hands and spending time with all of your partners and you right now. So we're looking forward to the time that we can do that as well. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Chuck. I appreciate the time. And more importantly, thanks for uh, the friendship along the way. As you mentioned, we've been working together for, for many years and I admire what you've done with the company and we're excited to be part of this journey. You just outlined a number of different exciting initiatives and we look forward to mutually participating in that success of Cisco. So thanks again for your insights and for your time as always and uh, stay safe and look forward to uh, hopefully connecting in person here at, at sometime in the near future. Thanks, Paul. Take care and have a great conference. And thank you for joining us. Next, we will have a short break before we hear from our VP of Global Partner Engagement and IoT, Sabine Haust, on the future of advanced technology. She's going to provide an interactive experience that you won't want to miss.